Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, the strength of all who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because in our weakness we can do nothing good without you, give us the help of your grace, that in keeping your commandments we may please you both in will and deed, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of the drought it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart, to give all to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus came down from the twelve apostles and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Walter Brueggemann, a renowned Old Testament scholar, happened to be a parishioner of mine for many of the years I was at St. Timothy's. He wrote the textbook on Jeremiah that I used in seminary, and he published one or two books every year. 
He said one time when he announced to one of his friends, I've written a new book. The friend replied, so Walter, what are you calling the book this time? He showed up one sun Sunday when I was scheduled to preach. As it happened, I was preaching on the Old Testament that day. I welcomed him to St. Timothy's and told him I was nervous to preach on the Old Testament with him there. I was hoping he would say something reassuring, but he simply said, I come to hear the gospel. Over the years he was there, he proved to be a very supportive friend. He had a great sense of humor. He loved the St. Louis Cardinals. And when the lesson, the psalm, or the gospel was uncomfortable, instead of the usual thanks be to God, you could hear him say, well, thanks for that. After today's gospel reading, I, I can almost hear him saying, thanks for that. As Luke tells the story, Jesus has just spent the night alone on a mountainside praying, choosing, before choosing his 12 apostles. As morning dawns, he and the disciples who had come with him descend from the mountain to find a vast crowd waiting for them. The crowd came from all over the place. And included in the crowd are the sick, the troubled, the rejected, the lame, the blind, and some with a crazy look in their eyes. They came to hear Jesus and to be healed of their diseases. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power poured out from him and healed them all. He just stood there on the plain where they could get to him, patting, pulling, grabbing. He did not let it bother him, or if it did, he didn't let them know. Some of the crowd were really hurting, and some were just plain greedy, but he did not discriminate among them. He stood among them instead and prayed a silent blessing on them. Then something happened that I had never noticed before. Luke points out that Jesus looked directly at all his followers and began to speak. Standing on a level place with the crowd, he told his would-be disciples unequivocally of God's blessing on the poor, the hungry, those who weep, the reviled, and of God's judgment on the rich, the sated, those who laugh, and the comfortable. Luke is saying, pay attention, all of you who would be his disciples, this is what discipleship actually looks like. This is the marvelous good news of the kingdom of God, a world turned upside down. It's an echo of the words Mary sang to Elizabeth. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty away. These are blessings that might sound ludicrous. That's not how things are supposed to work. It's a reordering of priority and privilege that the church will find awkward and even offensive for centuries to come. I don't know what to do with this stinging gospel. The temptation is to edit Jesus' words to make myself feel better. As in, he really didn't mean poor, did he? Homeless poor? Dressed in rags poor? Slum poor? Or hungry, as in literally hungry, starving for bread? Also, he couldn't possibly have meant sad people, as in people drowning in grief and despair. Wouldn't it be cruel to call them blessed? And surely he wasn't referring to those unlikable, unpopular, unimportant people no one can blame me for avoiding. Obviously, Jesus was exaggerating or speaking figuratively, kidding. I mean, come on, there must be some way I can wiggle out of the woes column into the blessed column instead. Unlike Matthew, whose Beatitudes I much prefer, Matthew softens things a bit by writing poor in spirit instead of poor, and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness instead of hungry. Luke keeps Jesus' sermon on the plain raw, 
terse and sharp. There's no way around it as far as Luke's Jesus is concerned. God's favor does not rest on the well-fed, the well-off, and the well-liked. It rests on those who have absolutely nothing to fall back on but God. No credit line, no nest egg, no immunity, nothing. If you want to know where God's heart is, Luke insists, look to the world's most reviled, wretched, starving, grieving, and desperate people. They are the blessed ones on whom God promise, God's promise of more and better rests. So what am I to do with this reading? Wallow in guilt? Romanticize poverty? Avoid happiness? I don't think so. The very fact that Jesus prefaces this hard teaching by alleviating suffering in every way possible suggests that he does not endorse misery for its own sake. Pain, in and of itself, is neither holy nor redemptive in the Christian story. And in fact, Jesus' ministry is all about healing, abundance, liberation, and joy. Also, his sermon on the plain is not prescriptive. Nowhere in his litany of blessings and woes does he tell his listeners how to behave. As Barbara Brown Taylor put it, the Beatitudes are not advice at all. When Jesus was telling anyone what he thought they should do, it's hard to miss. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. That's advice. Love, do, bless, pray, one imperative after another, with no distinction between rich or poor, hungry or well-fed. It's the same list for all, whether they happen to be weeping or bent over with laughter. It's not even judgment. It's simply the truth about the way things work pronounced by someone who loves everyone. So what am I, cozy and comfortable as I am in my healthy, happy, middle-class life, to do with this gospel reading? How shall I reflect on it, receive it, sit with it? I might begin by admitting that Jesus is right. That is to say, I might come clean about the fact that most of the time I am not desperate for God. I am not keenly aware of God's active daily intervention in my life. I am not on my knees with need, ache, sorrow, longing, gratitude, or love. After all, why would I be? I have plenty to eat. I live in a comfortable home. I have both health and health insurance. My children are safe. I have access to a vibrant social, intellectual, and recreational life. I am not in dire need of, well, anything. In short, there isn't much in my circumstances that leads me to a sense of urgency about ultimate things. Most of the time, it just plain doesn't occur to me that I would be lost, utterly and wholly lost physically and spiritually, without the grace that sustains me. I think what Jesus is saying in this gospel is that I have something to learn about discipleship that my life circumstances will not teach me. Something to grasp about the beauty, glory, and freedom of the Christian life that I will never grasp until God becomes my everything, my all, my go-to, my starting place and my ending place. Something to humbly admit about the limitations of my privilege. Something to recognize about the radical counterintuitiveness of God's priorities and promises. Something to notice about the power of plenty, to blind me to my own emptiness. Something to gain from the humility that says, those people I think I'm superior to in every way, they have everything to teach me. Maybe it's time to pay attention. Is it comfortable to sit in the woes column? No. 
Might a willingness to do anything save my life? Yes. Jesus says whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The world says law and order, and Jesus says love. The world says get, and Jesus says give. In terms of the world's sanity, Jesus is crazy as a coot, and anybody who thinks he can follow him without being a little crazy too is laboring under, less under a cross than under a delusion. This is not prosperity theology. This is not blessing as health, wealth, and happiness. This is a teaching so costly so soul-rattling, so unpalatable, that most of us will do anything to domesticate or ignore it. Blessed are you who are poor, hungry, sad, and expendable. Why? Because you have everything to look forward to. Because the kingdom of God is yours. Because God is the God of those who have nothing but him. The Beatitudes do not tell us what to do. They tell us who we are. And most importantly, they tell us who Jesus is. Blessed are you who loose your grip on the way things are, for God shall lead you to the way things shall be. Amen. Let us affirm our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Wayne, our provisional bishop, Ken, Nettie, and Wendell, our assisting bishops, and all bishops. For Darren, Heather, and Noel, our priests, Gary, our deacon, and the ministry of all the baptized. For all who serve God in his church. We pray also for those whose needs are closely linked with ours. And for those who suffer from any sickness, grief, or distress, especially those on our parish prayer list, including Becky, Clint, Earl, Ella, Emily, Jane, Janet, Lily, Lisa, Margaret, Nancy, Polly, Rose, the Roseburg family, Susie, Ted, 
and all those affected by natural disasters and human tragedies. We pray for the first responders and the aid and relief efforts that continue around the world, and especially for everyone affected by the coronavirus. We also pray for our shut-in parishioners and their caregivers. I invite your own names and concerns offered either silently or aloud. We pray especially for peace in our homes and around the world, remembering those who have lost their homes and families to violence here or abroad, as well as those who serve and protect our own freedom, especially Harrison, Matt, Becky, Jennifer, Steve, Philip, Perrin, and Tony. We pray for their safety as well as the just use of the power that is placed in their hands. Hear us, Lord for your mercy is great. Let us pray together for our Stephen ministry, saying, Caring God, thank you for how you call us to bring your light of hope and love to others. Continue to guide us in our care, especially with our Stephen ministers. Give those who feel they or someone close to them would benefit from a care-receiving relationship, the courage to ask for a Stephen minister to walk alongside them. By your presence and Holy Spirit, continue to strengthen our Stephen ministers and leaders to provide the Christian caregiving that you have prepared them to do. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. I invite your own thanksgivings offered either silently or aloud. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, especially Sudi, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Saying together, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Great Thanksgiving is with Eucharistic Prayer A, which begins on page 361 of the Book of Common Prayer, if you'd like to follow along. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is good, it is right and good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for by water and the Holy Spirit you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he'd given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me.
After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Using the prayer adapted by our National Cathedral, a spiritual communion is a personal devotional that anyone can pray at any time to express their desire to receive Holy Communion at that moment, but in which circumstances impede them from actually receiving Holy Communion physically. As we share in communion in one way or another, let us pray. Beloved Jesus, I believe that you are present in the Blessed Sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and that I, I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Let me never be separated from you in this life or in the life to come. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, those you love, and remain with you this day, this season, and forevermore. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.